Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I hope you are well. Today I am cutting this piece off. Look, it's done. I just need to put in a little bit of wet waste. And then, uh, then we'll be ready to cut it off. Um, oh, I knew I had seen a, something here. There we go. I need to put waste in because otherwise the thing will fall apart when it comes off the loom before I do the finishing. Favorite wider beater is still in Hawk in Massachusetts. Oh, here's a little bit wider one. Um, where it has been since my photo shoot for the book. One day, when quarantine ends in Massachusetts, I will get it back. I realized on Monday that I often miss a lot of your comments, so I was reading back over them Monday and there were a few that I missed, but sorry about that. It's very hard for me to do two things at once. Um, good morning to everybody from all over. Um, So, um, what? Snow in New York State, Debbie? <clears throat> it often snows in Colorado in May also, but um, I'm hoping that the snow is done. Um, Wisconsin and Tennessee and New Mexico and Hi, Anna in the UK and Paula in the UK. In Vancouver. <laughs> Thank God it's Wednesday. That's funny, McKenna. TGIW. Um, <clears throat> Jacksonville. Um, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Kansas. Western Colorado. I love that they call Western Colorado the Western Slope. It is where some of the best peaches I have ever had are grown. Western Colorado has a warmer, drier climate and they, if it's possible to have a drier climate than here, they grow some fabulous things out there. Corn and peaches are my favorite. I did finish the butterfly, y'all. Um, he turned out pretty cute. Turns out that I I didn't actually change. On Monday, I said I was going to take the eye out and redo it because I didn't like it. And I just forged forward and kept weaving and I didn't take it out. And it looks good. Looks good enough for what I intended. Yay! I'm glad Maya likes the butterfly. Um... Donald has a daughter, Maya, who is an amazing weaver already. So a shout out to you, Maya, for your amazing work. And I'm really sorry about Spanish market, but man, by next year, you are going to be rocking it. Um, 
So Kate asked if there's a row of knots here, and there is n there is not a row of knots. Um, I had to turn the loom over to look at what I did at the beginning, but all I did was a row. I did uh, two picks of warp as weft to make a really narrow border and one row of twining, and that's it. And the reason I did that is because my intention from the beginning was to weave... Um, was to do a braided finish, a plated edge. So, um, I don't need knots because the, um, I don't necessarily like the knots myself along with the braid because the knots make the little knots and then the braid isn't smooth. So, no knots. So Anna, you might need a drink to celebrate the cutting off. Um, it is drink 30 in the UK, so you go for it. Um, I try to do about a half an inch of waist to hold it together and this looks like it might be about enough. I am, um, this is a small weaving, so I don't know how big a drink it, um, it is needed, but uh, I was not going to cut this off on the, uh, I almost said on the television, <laughs> on uh, YouTube, but then I thought, yeah, why not? So, um, let's just look at what other questions you might have, and then I'm going to cut this thing off. I'll show you the back. I haven't seen the back either. Um, yes, those of you across the pond will have to have your evening libations for those of us who are barely awake yet. <laughs> um, Oh, Paula, good question. So she's asking why I wove that waist the way I did. So I wove, um, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you. Um, I wove, I just put a long piece of yarn in and wove and meet and separate. So the reason for that is um, mostly because I don't want the end of the piece to draw in, even in the waist, because the waist is going to come out, but I want it to stay as wide as it needs to stay. Um, I don't want the waist to dry in either because I'm gonna steam it and finish it and I don't want it to be narrower at the top. So if you keep more butterflies going in a wider area, it will keep your work from drying in. That's all about weft tension. So um, the better your weft tension, the fewer problems you will have. Um, Lynn, you have to Lynn says, is it best to cut off the f off before finishing the threads on the back? I would. I, um, yeah, unless you're doing sort of finishing as you go along as you're weaving, I think it's far too difficult to um, finish tails and sew other slits and fix problems when it's on the loom just because of the tension. There's just too much. It's far easier when it's off tension. So I've never done any of that while it was on the loom. Um, I'm sure there are people who do, but I don't do it that way. I take it off and then I do all the finishing. Um, welcome, Anne-Marie from New Jersey. I'm glad um, you had a break from work to join us live. That's very cool. Um, Windsor, Ontario and Kansas City and Michigan and Phoenix. Um, So, okay, cool, Kate. Kate was asking about the way I did the ends, and um, she says sometimes she uses the um, knots with sewing thread, which is another way to do it so they're invisible. You can do, she's talking about doing double, de double half hitch knots, which is um, a header that I talk about in the um, Little Looms class. And, um, 
it creates a knot that's quite visible. So if you do it with a thinner thread, it will still hold, but you won't see it. So that's a great way to go. Um, woo, Dana made a copper pipe loom this weekend. That's awesome. Perfect for the fringeless glass. Um, that's the four salvage class I did with Sarah Sweat, which is um, so much fun. Sarah is so much fun. Um, I just got to say, I really loved making that class. Um, I actually made bread yesterday, banana bread. I felt like I was missing out on the whole, um, you know, everybody on the planet is making banana bread and I felt like I was missing out. So I had to make some because we had bananas that were no longer edible, in my opinion, once a banana starts to get brown. Um, you can't eat it raw. Um, a steaming demo. Maureen, that's a good idea. And you are reminding me that... Um, I'm pretty sure in all of the classes that I have finishing videos in, that in none of them have I actually done a steaming demo. So maybe I will actually do a um, video of steaming, maybe even this piece, and um, I can add that to the um, Warp and Weft and Little Looms class. I think that's actually a fabulous idea. I think I just faked it in those classes. For whatever reason, I didn't have a piece ready to steam, so I didn't actually show show it and then um, realize later that people don't, I steam really heavily, like the piece is pretty wet, so it's hard to get that um, without a demo. Um, sure, Jennifer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a list because next week will be a whole new world. Um, Um, good tension and tying on on the the saffron loom is what she's asking about. Sorry, I cannot write and talk. Um, the saffron loom is um, on my list of things to bring out next week along with. Um, I'm looking hard at that new shaft loom too. So that will be really fun. So um, once I get the shaft loom out and put together, that one actually has to be assembled. But um Next week, I'm going to have time to put it together. So that'll be fun. Um, Lou is asking about breaking a warp, and it should work fine, Lou. Um, as long as you can weave on it, it should be it should be OK. You can also ask about that in the class. And with if you add a picture in the class, I'm happy to look at it. Um, see, I'm not the only one who made banana bread. If I had had zucchini, I would have chosen zucchini bread over banana bread, but. Okay, so let's, um, let's cut this thing off, okay? Why not? Um, I'll leave my face up here, but if I make funny faces, then uh, don't mind me. Okay, I'm gonna back this out. I think this is gonna work. So you can see the loom. Is that focusing? I think so. Um, okay. So on the Mirex, you want to take the tension, um, the shedding, undo the shedding, and release the tension. I did too much spinning yesterday, and my wrist is killing me. Um, this little muscle right here, it's from rotation. The therapist is yelling at me for doing that for not paying attention to her body. Okay, so what I often will do is actually cut it right above the um, warping bar on a narrow piece. Sometimes I just pull the warping bar out, but you're gonna have to cut those loops anyway. The reason I like to cut it right above the bar is because then it won't fall. Um, so I'm actually gonna, I guess I can just pull this out. The loops on the bottom don't matter. Um, okay, and then I'm actually going to cut it again because um, I don't want all the rain that falls. The heddles will fall. And I need, actually, maybe I will pull it down some. I want enough warp to easily, um, easily do the braid. Sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. So then, of course, I will very carefully save all of those heddles. 
put them in a little bag. And um, okay, let me hang on, y'all. I'm gonna move this camera. I didn't actually plan for this part. Okay, let's see if you can see this. Hey, look at that, it's pretty darn square. That's cool. So it actually goes this way. And um, <laughs> the uh, toenails are cracking me up. So the idea, this is called hot flash. And the idea, of course, is hot flashes waking you up at night. Um, and the little butterfly, I'm glad I added him because otherwise my original design didn't have that. So um, I didn't, as I was weaving it, I was about right here. And I was like, hmm, it seems kind of boring. So that's why I added the little butterfly guy. Let's see if this will focus. And then here's the whole thing. Okay, so here's what you really want to see, right? <laughs> here's the back. Um, could be worse, could be worse. So what I'll do from here is um, clean up a little bit of this. If this were a large format tapestry, if this had just come off my floor loom, I would, um, the first thing I would do would be to vacuum it because on the floor loom pieces, which are very large, if it's a large piece, the wool dust collects and it's all over um, the tapestry. So I would vacuum it and then um, start working on all of this finishing stuff. So the next thing will be to finish all of these ends. Um, and this is why I need the waist. So I do all the finishing of the ends before I do the edges because I want all the ends finished and then I steam it, which is going to shrink stuff. And I don't want my edges to be finished before I steam it. At least in my head, this is what my teacher James Kohler did. And I feel like it's a good, um, I feel like it's a good reason to do this. Um, if some of that warp is going to shrink in a little bit on the edges, I don't want it tied into knots. It's probably not actually what happens, but I don't have any real way of knowing. So um, finish all the tails, steam it, let it dry. Then I do the, then I'll do the braid and then I will do a tag and I will probably mount it and then it will be done. Okay. So, um, this piece was, um, was a silly piece that, uh, yeah, I, um, Um, a tapestry diary piece. Let's see if my brain will work. It's um, just a piece for fun. So um, there are a bunch of splices in there that, that I'll go through and snip off first. And then um, a lot of this silk, I don't trust the silk to stay put because it's so slippery. So the silk will all these little tails are the extra pieces. Um, the silk tails will get stitched in because I don't. Um, although this weave is pretty tight, it would probably be fine if I just left them long. I definitely don't want to cut them off flush with the fabric because I think they will pop out. So, um, that was fun. And uh, it turned out better than I thought. So that's cool. Um, let's see. Um, there you can see it. <laughs> um, someone asked about the Penelope loom from LeClaire. And I have had a student use one of those in a workshop. and. Um, she liked it. I didn't. So that's just the thing about the Penelope, of course, is it has those little tiny beams on it. And I don't, I just feel like tapestry looms with little beams. When the beams are small, it's hard to get a good tension. And so that's how I feel about the Penelope. I just, um, 
but I should say I have not used it myself and it does have um, sheds that move and I could be completely wrong. So if anybody has used the Penelope and you know, Sharon might like some thoughts about that. Um, okay, so I might have done this already, Marla, but is that focusing? She asked me to bring the piece closer to the camera. I will take some pictures. So also, so you can see some of the, I don't know if it will, how close it will focus, but um, you can see the two, um, the two sets. I can't imagine that I wouldn't write a blog post about this piece. So um, I will have some good pictures in there with a description of the two sets. Um, Um, Jan is asking what I do with the tails. So these will, so for example, this, I know this was a splice. Let's see if you can see right here. I apologize. Normally if I was going to show something flat, I would have the camera on a, I have a little boom where the camera can be suspended, but um, you can see that there's a splice there. Hold on. So those I will cut off because I have spl it's wool warp and I have spliced them. And so I'll just cut them like this. Can you see that? Yeah. And so all the splices I'll do that with. Like this was another splice. Because this Harrisville Kohler Singles, and I've used this yarn for a very long time, and I know that um, those splices will stay. They will not work out. Um, also, this is what my teacher used and what he did. Um, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tapestries. And so the really grabby wool, it works great. The splices work great. Um, so all those just get snipped off. But what I was talking about before is tails like this, where um, it's a piece of silk. Those um, tails I'm not confident about. If I just cut those off, and they're not spliced, and the um, silk is quite... Um, the silk is quite um, slippery. So if I just cut those off, I'm afraid that that little, like if I cut this little weft right there, that the tail of that is most likely going to pop to the front and I don't want that to happen. So I take, um, and this silk is super thin and I'm gonna stitch it into a thick weft so I don't even need to split up these. If I can, thread the needle. I don't need to split these tails. I can stitch both of these in together. Often I won't stitch a whole piece of yarn in at one time because it's too thick and you'll see the rib in the weaving. But in this case, this yarn is quite thin. So let's see if you can see that. Yep, so I just will do something like this to anchor it. And that gets um, held in quite well, and then that I just snip right off. So this piece will not have, some of my large pieces look almost identical on the front versus the back, except for the steps. Um, tapestry isn't reversible because the a hill valley on the, a hill thread on the front is a valley thread on the back. So um, it will never be completely reversible, but a lot of my big pieces look like they're fairly reversible. The back is clean. On small pieces, um, it's just not possible to manage a lot of tails in a way that's invisible. So I have given up that goal on smaller pieces. And this, in my mind, is a quite a small piece. Um, here's another splice. You can tell that I spliced those yarns together because there's. I was using a three-ply and there's six little um, yarns in a row. So those I just cut right off. Isn't that fun? Um, and there's quite a few of those. But again, the silk ones will get stitched in. Just enough to hold them in so I know they're not going to pop to the front. If, you know, a piece might get vacuumed 
Um, it will get vacuumed. If it's displayed for many years, it will need to be vacuumed. And so you want to make sure that uh, um, vacuuming a piece won't pull the tails to the front. And then these are tails from, um, these single ones are probably, so here was a tail that's just hanging out by itself. It's just one tail. Probably that was an eccentric outline. And so those also, they're not spliced, and so most often I will, it's wool, so I don't need to um, really secure it too strongly. I just put it under a couple little weft things and then cut that off. Okay, so there it is. Get the champagne. You're right, Victoria. So John and Victoria and I and anyone else who's here from the Taos retreat, bottoms up. We had a cutting off of a big tapestry at the Taos retreat. And we did have champagne. It was really fun. It was John's piece, actually, the um, beautiful piece of a car that he did. Um... Yes, the foot was dangling in the air, Michelle. I know. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's still, I still think it's a super weird design, but it was a lot of fun. And so that was my main goal. Like, it just was a lot of fun. That was the whole idea. I really wanted this to be the piece for renditions when renditions was going to be an in-person show. But um, yeah. Maybe in future, maybe the next ATA unjuried small format show, maybe this piece will be the one. Or maybe I'll have done another silly piece. So good question, Carolyn. It is 10 inches square. So the renditions, um, I did design it for that um, ATA unjuried show. And the specs for that show are um, 10 inches square or less. And so I made it 10 inches um, <laughs> yeah, it's true, Linda. It's, it's a waiting game when you're doing the finishing and, and some people actually let the pieces just sit and relax for a couple of days. Actually, that's never a problem. I almost never, um, have trouble letting a piece just sit still after I take it off. I usually take a piece off the loom, a big piece, in private, and I just put it aside and don't look at it for a while because I'm always afraid about it. But this one I figured, this one I don't have a lot of emotional like angst about, so that's why I was willing to cut it off today. Um, so yeah, Susan, um, there's so much information about mounting pieces. I probably won't talk about that and change the shed, but um, I know that some of the classes that you're in, have at least one of the classes you're in has information and definitely ask about it there because um, I have changed some of my opinions about mounting pieces over the years also. In my book, there's a whole section about showing exactly how to mount pieces using stretcher frames. And um, I've also been talking to Tommy Scanlon more about mounting pieces because her pieces are the most beautifully mounted pieces that I've of tapestries that I've seen really um, anywhere. They're just gorgeous and so perfect. And she actually uses a firm piece of archival foam core to wrap the um, mount around. So that's something that I do want to try. Soon, actually, I might try it with this piece if I can f get my art supply store to get me some archival foam core. Um, Jeannie, is a, that's a great question. Is asking how do you know which ones are splices and which ones aren't? And that, and I might have already answered this, but that's where I'm looking for. I just am recognizing that when I do a splice, it looks like. Let's see if I can find another one. Here's one. It looks like this because of the way I do it. I know there's going to be six ends in a row on the same line, the same weft line. So that's what I'm looking for. I know that's a splice and then I can cut it off. If I've been careful doing my splices, they always look the same. Um, 
if I'm not sure about something or if it's in an area that's unstable, like an area of the tapestry that has a lot of things going on, I might be less likely to cut off any of the yarns at the surface because if the fabric is looser, they're much more likely to work to the front. So you just have to go with um, your feeling about how firm the fabric is and whether you think it's going to, whether the yarn is gonna stay put or not, depending on what kind of yarn it is and um, all those other factors. Um, Oh yeah, great. That's a great tip, Judy. Um, so James Kohler was my teacher and she's, um, Judy's talking about his book. It's called Woven Color. So if you have it, um, there's, um, he talks a lot about technique and, and that kind of thing. So design info, everything else. Anyway, I'm sure um, a few of you have it, and if you don't, and your guild, if you belong to a weaving guild, um, ask them to buy it. It's an expensive book. If you don't have the funds to buy it yourself, go and have your guild buy it, and then you borrow it. And always, at, always, if you're in a guild, go to the library on the last guild meeting of the year so you get to keep the book all summer. I, don't ask me why I know that. Um... Okay, so you all, um, so Donald is saying that he um, anchors all his threads and I, um, I, would, I wouldn't cut them off unless I spliced them, Donald. Um, I feel like if it's a whole piece of yarn and I just cut it off, um, that, that, like if I just cut off this, this, these tails were not spliced, I wouldn't cut these off, I would actually, separate the plies and needle them all in um, because um, I'm afraid that the whole piece of yarn will actually pop to the front just because it has more popping power. <laughs> but that said, my first teacher, Karen Martinez, we did Rio Grande weaving in um, El Rito, New Mexico, and every single tail, we just cut it right off at the surface. Um, and they stayed, but the tension was super, super high and the beat was really, really hard. So, um, yeah, Janet, I don't know who could make their small tapestries reversible. I gave that up, that idea up very quickly when I started doing smaller things. Um, Um, Paula, weaving in the tails in the direction of the warp threads more secure than weaving in horizontally. So she's asking if, is it more secure to weave a tail um, along the warp rib, which is what I was demonstrating, or to weave it horizontally? I never, so in knitting, I would weave in the tails along in a horizontal direction to sort of try to hide it in the knit stitches. But with tapestry weaving, when you needle them in under the weft along the warp, channel they disappear if you sort of looped them over the weft horizontally they would you would see them so my goal on my big pieces is that they disappear completely um, but i don't actually think that that's more secure than um, doing it any other way <clears throat> jessica you probably are having a lag in your um, internet um, yeah, I don't know. Those of you who are having internet lags, it's, it has to do either with YouTube or your internet. So you can try, someone suggested this, you can try resetting, restarting the video that sometimes helps or refreshing your browser. All of my tips for those of you in the online classes, when you're having trouble with technology, my number one tip is please refresh your browser. Um, it will fix so many things. So that is always the number one thing. Refresh your browser or open a new window. It really does work. Of course, if your internet's completely slow, then. Um, cool, Dorothy. Whittling your own tools, awesome. Um, 
Yeah, Sarah, if you haven't seen Sarah's blog, she made another rigid huddle out of driftwood or something. So she's amazing. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, so cool. You all, that was really fun. I will clean this up a little bit and um, take some pictures of all of that and put it on the blog probably next week. Um, but I will, um, I think I'll probably, we'll see how it goes, bring it back on Monday and show you the progress. So that'll be fun. And then I'll have another loom with something on it on Monday. <clears throat> Today is Wednesday, which means I will be back on Monday at 1030 Mountain and Monday and Wednesday next week. And um, Colorado is now in this safer at home phase, which um, I don't know how long any of it will last. But for me, that means I'm just doing the same old stuff. So I hope y'all are staying home and staying safe. And um, my little llama guy says hi. And um, thanks for <laughs> encouraging me on this piece for so many weeks. You all have been very kind about watching me weave this forever and ever. And um, I have some new pieces in mind to start soon. And I can't wait to see what you all are weaving on also. I love on Instagram, those of you who are sharing what you're weaving with the um, hashtag. But even just um, following you all on Instagram is fun and a few of you on Twitter. I do look on Twitter every few days. So if you're on Twitter, use the hashtag and um, yeah, that is what I know for today. And I hope that you all have a fantastic um, weekend. I can say that now. Have a good weekend. I'll be back on Monday and um, yeah, that was fun. I'll have more on the blog. Um, well, I'll have new stuff on the blog tomorrow. So we'll see you there.